Well, good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning. to welcome each and every one of you as we gather together today in worship. I'm, I'm looking around and uh, I think I recognize every face as folks who are regularly with us, apart from a couple of visitors. I welcome Tom and Dorothy Glover with us this morning. Now, I've known Tom since I was a wee boy. Tom has known me since I was a wee boy. So I hope that that will not prove embarrassing for either of us. But uh, Tom, we welcome uh, you here. Tom has served the Lord over many, many years as an evangelist uh, and also in pastoral ministry. And it's good to have you with us here today. A couple of notices uh, that you will have seen there in front of you, just things to, to remind you of. Uh, I'll mention again uh, the need at Children for Christ uh, for either good used or new dishcloths uh, and good solid uh, thick dishcloths for the camps, for the camp ministry there in Romania uh, as that commences uh, and also pillow protectors again either new or good used condition uh, for those who have already contributed to that uh, then I want to say thank you very much for that but there is also the opportunity there for others. I also want to make an announcement this morning uh, concerning uh, a Mrs. May or, or Mary Wilson who some of you in the church will remember. Uh, May is how she was known in the church. Uh, was a member here uh, probably up to about 35 maybe 40 years ago uh, and has passed away recently. Uh, I visited her son uh, during the week there. He's asked me to take his mum's funeral service. He indicated that he didn't really expect there to be many present. And I said that I would encourage, uh, especially those within our church, who would remember me as should be known here. Uh, but perhaps others if you were available too uh, for that service at a quarter past one on Friday. Uh, at Mason Bill. Can I also ask you to be in prayers for the service which will follow immediately after that at Mason Hill? Uh, a lad called David, David Crichton, uh, who has been well known to the folks in, in Broken Chains uh, for many, many years, along with his partner Rachel. Uh, and David passed away uh, there probably about three weeks ago now. And, and David's service will take place. Uh, at Mason Hill immediately. So we're remembering Rachel in prayer there, and, and also Mrs. Wilson's son, Colin, who any who have been through Prestwick Academy in recent decades would probably remember Colin as the principal teacher of music. Uh, so if you were able to be there on Friday at 1.15, that would be an encouragement to him, and he, he explicitly said that I, I, I should invite folks who would remember his mum. Uh, to be there. So these are notices and another notice to share with you which uh, I mentioned at the close of our church meeting on Wednesday evening and that is that after much prayer and deliberation our brother Ronnie Cartwright has decided that this is the right time for him to call an end to his serving of the Lord here at New Presswick in the role of church secretary. A role which Ronnie has uh, upheld for, for almost eight years and uh, we therefore want to thank you Ronnie, thank you for your service, your service for the Lord uh, in the interim and up until our AGM in June, uh, our brother Arnold, Arnold Clements will uh, assume the role of church secretary uh, and then following our AGM going forward uh, we can, uh, take things from there. But Ronnie, just want to say on behalf of the whole fellowship, our thanks to you for your service. And I think as I said to you on Wednesday evening, maybe this means now that when I drive along Addington Road at 10 or 10.30 in the evening, I won't see your office light on. <laughs> so, but no, thank you for your service. We've come here to worship God. And in Psalm 103, we read these words, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, 
who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. There are many songs that have been based around these opening verses of Psalm 103, but we'll begin our worship this morning by singing that classic Christian hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. circumstances our prayer would be that we would find our peace in you in a God who does all things well we bless you Father for the times when we have known that as, as Bonner put it the calm of sins forgiven Times when we have known, Father, in your goodness, the lifting of an illness, the alleviating of our pain, and we bless you and we thank you for your healing. 
times, Father, when we have known in whatever form that pit has been, you have lifted us from it. But, Father, in those words of one who suffered greatly in the 1940s, as she said to her sister, Cory Tenpoon, there's no pit so deep that Christ is not deeper still. <clears throat> Father, wherever we may be this morning, whether we're on a mountaintop, you are with us. And Father, even if we're in the valley, help us to know that we are not alone. Because you're the God who has promised that you will never leave one of your children. And you never have. And you never will. So as we gather to bring you our worship and our praise this morning, our prayer would be that the songs from our lips, the thanks from our heart, our prayers, our attentiveness to your word, Father, that all of this in worship would be pleasing to you, that Christ would be glorified, and that we might be blessed. This we ask, Father, we thank you. For our brother Ronnie's service. And pray your continuing blessing upon him and Marion in the, the years ahead that you might be pleased to grant them. So hear us now, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to continue in praise, friends. We're going to continue in praise as we. Sing firstly, All My Days, Beautiful Saviour. And then, Jesus, what a beautiful name. Let me encourage you to stand if you feel able. If halfway through, perhaps, you feel you need to take a seat, then feel free to do that as well. But we're going to sing together, All My Days, and then, Jesus, what a beautiful name. Let's stand.
us take our seats. Now, I'm looking at all these youngsters here and thinking, what beautiful names of God. Zachary, that's a lovely name. And Amelia. And Sam. Do you know why I really like Sam? Sam? Because my dad's name was Sam. And that's my middle name. And that's my boy's middle name as well. So Sam's a lovely name. And I'm, 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 I'm going to stop short pretty much at, at, uh, b- before we get into the teenage years for embarrassing. But we've got Eve. Eve, I've got Finley. And we've got a whole host of other lovely names. But we've just sung about a beautiful name. What was the beautiful name that we've just sung about? You're going to go for it, Amelia? Looks like it's on the tip of your tongue. Or maybe Sam's. <laughs> Looking around. Eva going to help us out here? Jesus, absolutely. Thank you, Eva. What a beautiful name. And all the wonderful things that we've just sung about that Jesus means to us. Yeah, you know, Jesus in some ways was a kind of almost ordinary name. Because it was a word that was the same as one of the Old Testament prophets called Joshua. And what it really means is God saves. God saves. And that's why it's a beautiful name. And you know, before Jesus was born, and and I am sure that most of you pretty much had your names chosen before you were born. Most parents will say, well, if it's a girl, it's going to be such and such. If it's a boy, it's going to be such and such. And, uh, and we try to make that decision. And then others will say, well, we'll just wait till they come along. <laughs> we'll wait till they come along and decide to think. Did they look like a chemist? <laughs> Well, I'd like to think I did, because after all, Kenneth means handsome. <laughs> like to think. But sometimes we just wonder about our names. But you know, before Jesus was born, it wasn't left up to Mary and Joseph to scratch their heads and think, what are we going to call him? An angel came. An angel came to Joseph and said, this baby that Mary's going to have, You're going to call him Jesus. He's listening. You're going to call him Jesus. Because he's going to save his people from their sins. Just like that may mean Yahweh or or God saves. Jesus would be the savior that God would send. And that's why he would be called Jesus. And that, to me, is why Jesus is a beautiful name. I'm going to pray for you, boys and girls, before you head out to Sunday school or Bible class. Let's pray. Gracious Father and our God, we want to thank you for the beautiful name of Jesus. The one who was promised for so long. The one who came and was born of Mary and Raised by Joseph, but was your own son. And given that name, Jesus, Father, we thank you for the salvation that is ours. Through faith and trust in him, by believing on his name. Your word tells us to everyone who believed in his name, we have the right to be your children. And how we thank you for this. So, Father... The boys and girls as they head into a final week of school before they have the Easter break. We pray that you would watch over them. And whatever's planned for 
the Easter break, we pray you would protect them through that also. Hear as we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, time now for Sunday's cool and for Bible class. chapter 10. We've been in this part of Mark's Gospel for the past two weeks and again today. First in chapter 8, then last week in chapter 9, now in chapter 10. And we're going to read together from verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them? And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of God. Easter weekend is only a fortnight away. Our thoughts are very much turning to towards the events that took place in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. Events upon which world history is centred around. No event more significant in the life of mankind than the events that took place that weekend in Jerusalem so long ago. <clears throat> events of eternal significance. And as we notice over these past two Sundays, there are three occasions in which Jesus, recorded here for us in Mark's Gospel, 
seeks to prepare his disciples for the reality of what is about to take place. Of course, in chapter 8, then in chapter 9. And all the time they're getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. They're getting closer and closer to these events. So in the first verse of our reading this morning, we read, And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them, as would quite often be the pattern with a, a, a rabbi. And of course, many respected and regarded Jesus as, as a rabbi, but also much more. And, but he would go ahead and they would follow. And we read here that they were amazed and those who followed were afraid. That's an interesting coupling of words. On the one hand, amazement, and on the other hand, fear. One hand, perhaps, amazement that, that Jesus was actually going up to Jerusalem because many of them knew that the religious leaders, the religious authorities were out to get him. If Jesus actually wanted to spare his life, Jerusalem was the last place he would have been going in these days. Some of them have been made amazed at the fact that he was going simply because of, of the danger they assumed that he would face. Others were perhaps amazed at the fact they had actually got this far. Because remember, they are still very much working with a mindset which sees an earthly Messiah as one who will bring liberation. Political liberation. Amazed that perhaps they're, they're on the cusp of this. I, I mentioned to you before a, a, a letter which I, I treasure that was written by my grandfather's brother to him as part of the liberating army. <laughs> marching their way towards Germany. They would have a sense of amazement that after all that had happened, here they were, and, 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 and they were hopeful that in the coming months they would see that dreadful war brought, brought to an end. Yet also fear. Fear of what lay ahead. Dreadful fear. Because if, and, and I believe that it is a, a major part of their mindset, they, they believe that, that Jesus is, is coming into Jerusalem to, to establish this earthly rule, which will see the, the, the Romans driven out. They realize they're not going to go quiet. Very real fear about what is to take place. And as we'll no doubt, God willing, ponder in our thoughts next Sunday, as we think of that triumphal entry, there would be a sense for some of them as they see Jesus coming in on, on a donkey rather than a war horse, a sense that Jesus is sending out the wrong message. The last thing they really want Jesus to appear to be doing is coming in peace. <laughs> they want to see change, even if that change involves conflict, that will bring about for them their idea of, of, of what Messiah ought to do. So Jesus speaks to them. I've put a heading on top of that slide that says for the third time. <laughs> Sometimes, perhaps as parents, that's a phrase we find in our lips. Or perhaps as bosses or whatever else, whatever other context, we're kind of getting frustrated. <laughs> For the third time. Of course there are many jokes. That are built up around. People having to repeat things. But this is really too serious. For, for humor. 
Now this is the third time Jesus is saying to, to his disciples just what is going to happen. They just do not seem to be taking it in. We've already seen Peter rebuke Jesus and say, you know, don't, don't, don't talk like that. You know, and, and we thought, you know, Peter, what, what a nerve. And then, of course, the, on the way, they're arguing among themselves as to, as to who is the greatest. They're just not getting it. So for the third time, Jesus spells it out perhaps in more detail than he has done before. He says, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. It's as if each time Jesus gives us prediction, he adds more detail. In past Sundays, we've looked at the connections with Isaiah 53. Here, the, the, the mocking, the, the spinning, all of this, this is right out of Isaiah 50. And some would say, well, well Jesus had just read those and, and, and he saw himself fulfilling these. No, but Isaiah wrote those words by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was already predicting what would happen to the Messiah. This is not simply Jesus looking at a role and somehow trying to fulfill it. This was purposed from the very beginning. You know, friends, God doesn't simply know history. God writes history. God writes history before it happens. You know, there are some of a, a model of trying to understand God's sovereignty, and they, they call it open theism, and, and that is that God, God has some sort of general control over the big picture, but, but in a sense just tries to make something out of the, the mess that we make. No. God is not playing an eternal game of catch-up trying to sort us out. Our God is sovereign. And yes, there are times when hard things. Whereas others would, in past ages, have called them dark providences. Come upon our lives that, that we struggle to understand. But, but God knows. And Jesus, who is God, the Son of Man. Remember back a couple of weeks ago or more, we... Look at that contrast between the Ancient of Days, seeing there the Father, and the Son of Man as, as the, 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 the second person of the Trinity, that the Lord himself, Jesus. Together in this, and all authority being given to him. And it doesn't really look like there's much authority happening here. Because when the chief priests have got hold of him and the scribes, they'll condemn him to death. Of course, they couldn't carry out that sentence, so they'll hand him over to the Romans and he'll be mocked and spat on and flogged and killed. And after three days rise, there is a purpose. There's a divine purpose in all of this. But having noted that divine purpose of a God who is sovereign in all things, we then encounter what I've entitled an audacious request. You know, if Peter had a nerve rebuking Jesus, then along come James and John. <laughs> Jesus has just told them all that's going to happen. It's as if they're saying, well, okay, but we want the top jobs. <laughs> you know, we still, we're still convinced that that you are, 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 are coming in, in, into your kingdom and, 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 and we, we want the best cabinet positions, you know. What I mean, you know, let's be honest, and I keep saying this, keep the, let's keep the pulpit apolitical, but let's be perfectly honest. In the early days of next week, we're going to probably see a fair bit of cabinet shifting. <laughs> uh, 
you know. There's a lot going to be happening in, in Hollywood. But here are these guys, and they're wanting the top jobs. Notice how they begin. We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. How many of us have learned our lesson when given a request like that, and we'd say, okay. If you're wise, you don't just say, okay. You say exactly what Jesus said. What do you want me to do? Before we agree, carte blanche, to, to meet someone's request, we need to know what the request is. And their request is to grant one at your right hand and one at your left in glory. They're, they're basically wanting the, the, the top cabinet positions. And you read it and, and you think, what had just gone before when they were arguing about who was greatest and Jesus had brought a little child to them and, 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 and said, no, you know, the greatest is the one who serves. It's not about jockeying for position. It's about being willing to be a servant. And they still so clearly hadn't got it. And of course, we read from the other Gospels that there was also a, a rather ambitious mother <laughs> behind the scenes here, trying to effectively get the same position for her boys. Now, <coughs> yeah, sometimes we don't get it. Sometimes we can be blind to the real purpose of Christ coming. We can be blind even to the real purpose of coming to Christ. There are those who come to Christ because they see Christ as perhaps the, 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 the solution to, to some practical earthly problems of God. And, and let's be honest, there are those who are all too happy to sell Jesus as just that sort of solution. And there's others who think, well, in some societies, those who profess faith are, it would seem, re receive certain uh, positive status within society. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll be in it for what we can get out of it. Now, sometimes we, as I've said, can be just as blind to the real purpose of Christ's coming. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. So Jesus responds and says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we're able. We're saying, we're up for it. The very fact that they're saying we're able makes us wonder again, have they, they really grasped what, what is happening, what, what Jesus is saying? Have they grasped anything of the awfulness of what is about to come, of which Jesus is totally, fully aware? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're able. Jesus replies, the cup that I drink you will drink. With the baptism with which I'm baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or, or my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And even Jesus here, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, acknowledges the sovereignty of God his Father in all of this. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. It's often been said if we try to organize things our way, it would probably look very different from the way that God does things. Because we look to the strong and God uses the weak. Man looks to the rich and God uses the poor. 
Isn't that lovely? Not many were rich, not many were noble, not many. You know the verse I'm talking about? I'm trying to remember, I think it's in Romans. There was this wonderful lady called the Countess of Huntington. And she used to say that she considered herself in all humility to be especially blessed. Why? Because it said, not many were noble. You had this woman from the, 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 the highest heights of English nobility <coughs> was by God's Spirit brought to saving faith in the Lord Jesus. And committed to use what in her day were unbelievable riches for the expansion of God's kingdom. She was honored, she said, to be counted as one of the not many. Because God doesn't generally use those who, as it were, have found themselves in those positions that society looks on as great. No. God uses humility. Humility of heart. And God knew who those places were for. But he has spoken of this cup. He has spoken of this baptism. And, and, and how would you understand these terms? Well, both cup and, and baptism are are metaphors of, of great trial and of judgment. The cup especially. Speaking of God's judgment. I mean that very much in Isaiah. <coughs> Baptism speaking of trials. We find that in the book of Job. And Jesus speaks of, of this cup. This, that, this baptism. Yes. Jesus would drink the cup. The cup of God's divine wrath against sin. He would drink that cup. For he would bear his people's sins. Spurgeon who put it this way, that Jesus Having finally in the garden reconciled this reality that it was not his will to be done, but that the Father's will would be done. And as Spurgeon said, he lifted the cup and with one long draught he drank damnation dry. And dear ones, if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, when Jesus drank that cup, that is precisely what he did for you. He drank damnation. <clears throat> that is why we can say there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus drank the cup. And he drank it dry. And yes, we speak of a baptism of fire. That's a dreadful trial. What greater trial has any man gone through than that trial which Jesus went through? And I'm not simply talking here before Pilate. I'm talking here. about all of it. The heartfelt agony of his cry in the garden, why have you forsaken me? The pain of seeing the disciples leave him. Of Peter's denial. And then on the cross, the darkness. My God. My God. Why have you forsaken me? And as one of our songs says, he was forsaken that we might be forgiven. For all the punishment that was due to us was laid on him. 
What a trial. Yet Jesus said they too would be baptized with him as they are baptized into him in his name. Yes, they would go through many trials and much suffering for the name of Christ. For many it would mean martyrdom. Were they really ready for that? Of course, the martyrdom did not begin until the Spirit came. And many of us perhaps have heard the stories of martyrs. I read some words from Richard Wormbrand, who, whose name may be familiar to some. He said, it was clearly understood in, in the communist prison camp that we were not to preach. If, 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 they were, if, if, if we preached, they would beat us. And he said, so... We came, to, we came to an agreement. We would preach and that would make us happy. They would beat us and that would make them happy so we were all happy. <laughs> what a trial. Yet for the sake of Christ and for his name. And some of us say, but could, could I truly know that? That martyr strength? Could, could I be that friend that has been proved down the years that our God does not necessarily give martyr grace until his martyr time? And then his people will know his presence in that same way as Stephen looked up and saw Jesus standing as the rocks rained down and received into his kingdom. Friends, who can tell what cup or what baptism we may face? Yet if we are Christ's, let us not imagine that we might go through life in some sort of pain-free way all the way to glory. <coughs> because following Christ <coughs> is costly. Time is going. I must conclude. It was very clearly after this statement that we are able that it was less than time. They've still not got it. When the twin and ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. They're saying, oh, what on earth? <laughs> now these are the same guys who've just been <laughs> arguing about who was greatest, just, just back down the road a bit. Oh, but, but now, oh, what on earth? James and John, what on earth? And Jesus called to them, Call them to him. So, it's not a be like this. You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. My kingdom runs along different lines. Very, very different. You know, my little quote from Salty's singing bot song book triggered a few memories last week. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you've got to be a servant of all. But you know, friends, this is a message that Jesus repeats because it needs to be repeated for us to get it. Whoever would be first among you must be slave. Servants and slaves, two words. The word for slave there, doulos. One, one, one whose, whose whole being, whose whole destiny is in the hand of another. That lovely word now, the newest vessel that OM ships are putting to sea, doulos hope. Doulos hope, a slave to hope. To take hope around the world, to take it to places that the larger vessels, vessel, Logos Hope, cannot go because, because of its draft, I think that's the right word. Mm -hmm. To take the good news wherever it can go. As slaves and as servants. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. You know that word there is diakonos, it's the word that we get deacon. 
even Jesus came to serve a service. <coughs> but here, as this verse ends, we get to the very heart of what this servant would do. He would give his life as a ransom for many. For many. You know, There would be those who would look at the church around the world today and say, well, Christianity seems to be in decline. And I can certainly see where they might get that from. And they might say that, oh, but if, if you look, for instance, to Africa and, and you see there millions and millions and, and then you actually speak to those who are at the heart of the work in Africa and they'll, they'll say it's, it's 3,000 miles wide and three inches deep. Desperate need for, for teaching, for discipleship. There was even that time when the disciples said Jesus to Jesus, Lord, are there few that will be saved? Because Jesus had made it clear that it wasn't easy, that the road was narrow. Don't assume for one minute that this is a great broad highway all the way to heaven. No, the road is rough and steep. And some of you that remember that old chorus will recall that it then says, so we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Are there few that will be saved? And there's John. He's an old man. He's been exiled to an island in the Mediterranean called Patmos. And he's on the Lord's day. And he has this remarkable vision. Of the risen Christ in all his glory. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. And he delivers to him as it were. Report cards. Inspections. On seven local churches in Turkey. And apart from one it's not looking good. <coughs> and actually one is on the verge of, of basically being shut down. With the lampstand being removed from it. And John's probably aware that he's the last of the disciples. The rest are all dead with probably all, if not with the exception of one having been martyred for their faith. And then he sees heaven. And he's told that the angels numbered 10,000 times 10,000. And then he's shown the redeemed, the saved, and they form a multitude that no man can number. No man can number. Friends, let us have hope in the gospel. Let us believe that Jesus has done what he has said he will do. He will ransom redeem his people from their sins and save them and ransom many. And the question really is not do you know how many he's ransomed but do you know he's ransomed you? Have you put your trust in him? Have you believed in him for salvation? Do you know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? That's something Colin said to me, to be sure to say on Friday. His mum knew her name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because this king, this servant king, died to be our saviour. And as we approach closer and closer this Easter season, May that wonderful truth rest more and more in our hearts and our minds. We're going to sing together in closing as part of our sermon says, From heaven you came, the servant came. <coughs>
say, please take your seats. Roger, could you come and join me at the front, please? Roger Perry. Uh, Roger, you've been worshipping with us for nearly a couple of years now. But that's not the start of the story. Not only did you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as, as little more than a boy, as, as a teenager. But some 40 or more years ago, Roger worshipped with the folks here at New Priceway Baptist Church and at work and various other things have moved you around the country. But in God's purpose, he has brought you back among us in these past two years. Roger has requested to be counted as a member here at New Prestwood Baptist Church and on sharing Roger's testimony uh, at our meeting on Wednesday evening, those who were there unanimously uh, agreed to welcome you into fellowship among us, Roger. So it's, it's my privilege as, as pastor of New Prestwood Baptist Church and again as a friend, for I've probably known you for close on 10 years. But uh, as, as a friend and pastor, to welcome you and pray that you indeed will know God's blessing and be a blessing to us in your service here at New Prestwood Baptist. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we want to thank you for the path of life that you lead each one of us along. And along that path, Father, there are those who you bring us among. And then you move us away. And sometimes in your purpose, you bring us back. And we thank you that although over all of these years, Roger has walked with you and, and served you, we thank you that you have brought him back uh, among the people here at New Christ. And we look forward to his continuing service and your continued blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, Roger. Thank you. Before our brother Paul Algio leads us in prayer and we <coughs> share together in communion, let us hear some words from Romans chapter 8. Words which I quoted earlier in my message. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Or may we be those who day by day, more and more by the Spirit's work in our hearts, find ourselves setting our minds on the Spirit. As he would lead us, guide us, change us, to make us more like Christ. The one who gave his all for us to ransom us, to restore us, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, we sang in our opening praise. Who like we his praise should sing indeed for all he has done. We should be a praiseful people and a thankful people who never forget his benefits, but above all, never forget his passion. Never forget his sacrifice. 
So before we come to share in the bread and wine, Paul, would you lead us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the privilege that it is to join here together to uh, hear the preaching of your word and to uh, sing to your praises. We thank you for the good news in which we have heard this morning, Lord. We thank you that, that you so loved the world that you gave your one and only Son that we might live eternally. We thank you, Father, for his example. We thank you that he came to, uh, to serve and not to be served, Lord. And I pray that each one of us here who know you would do likewise. We thank you, Lord, that at this point we can uh, remember uh, that sacrifice that he gave, Lord, these, this, uh, this juice and this wafer, Lord, mean nothing in and, in and of themselves, Lord, but we thank you for that which they, they symbolise. We thank you that he was willing to come uh, to be uh, captured, to be beaten, uh, to be killed on that cross, and his blood to be shed, Lord, that our sins may be forgiven. <coughs> Pray that each one of us, as we think in these things, Lord, would uh, be touched afresh of your love, of your grace, and of your mercy to us, and that we would do likewise with those who we come into contact with. So we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. It was to remember a great deliverance that the disciples gathered that night with Jesus. It was to remember that dreadful night in which God brought his people out of Egypt. Protected only by his promise that when he saw the blood that was shed, the blood of the Lamb, his judgment would pass away. Yet it was there at that same remembrance that Jesus took bread. And having given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let us together eat of the bread. same way the Lord Jesus took of the cup saying this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood I bring you all of it so let us drink together Gracious Father, we bless you for the fellowship shared around this table. The fellowship that we know as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fellowship that we have with you, our Father, through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we be ever mindful, not forgetful, of your many blessings but above all, of the redemption that is ours in him. For those absent from us, Father, we pray your blessing also. Mentioning our dear sister Arlene as representative of those who 
need a special touch from you at this time, Lord. Remember Arlene and Jimmy, and we lift them up before you. But are not unmindful of others. And pray your blessing on them too. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Let us bring our gathered worship to a close, friends, as we sing together, There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. And following the singing, uh, I've asked Tom if he would close in prayer. Tom Glover. Thank you, Tom. <laughs>